Welcome to Big Blend Radio, where we celebrate variety and how it adds spice to quality of life. Everybody, we're excited to have author Matt Cost back on Big Blend Radio. Today, he's going to be talking about his new book. It's called City Gone Askew. It's a follow-up from Velma Gone Awry. And uh, he is an author of numerous historical fiction novels and also Mm -hmm. mystery series. Uh, The last time he talked about was a last uh, book he talked about was Pirate Trap. And um, if you listen to that interview, which we'll link over so people can, uh, we talked about a very surprise thing in the book that um, Nancy was going to discover. And she did. She walked Mm -hmm. out just like I thought she would with big eyeballs going, what is in Matt's head? And um, then she started to read this book and finished City Gone Askew and said, what is in Matt's head? Where does he pull this stuff from? And he makes it work. So, Matt, um, Nancy and I both think you are highly intelligent and you really put things in novels that people do not think of doing. So welcome back. How are you? (laughs) Uh, I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me back. And I'd just like to say, I guess, that you know, just about all my books start off with factual information before I start twisting and turning it into fiction. But sometimes mm. it's the facts that are stranger than the fiction. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, because you, you teach us history while you're, you know, entertaining us, right? At, you know, I I did, I think I called you quirky. I said, like, Matt is quirky, you know, <laughs> on one of our, I think it was our happy hour show, which he's the king of happy hour here on Big Blend Radio. But and I meant that as a, a compliment because I think that's you're telling the stories of people. And I think that helps. And you are also a teacher. So putting in the quirky, which mostly is true, does that help people understand history, do you think? Um, I'm not sure if the quirky necessarily does, other than the fact that it's OK to learn about history and be entertained at the same time mm. as a you know, growing up, I was never a big fan of my own history classes because it was taught in the most boring manner possible with an overhead projector and you, you know, madly write down notes of dates and times mm-hmm. and people. And at some point I realized that you could teach history in a very entertaining and fun way and still learn and mm-hmm. actually learn much better. So I try and do that with my historical fiction. Well, and I think that's what I really love about it because I remember in school, I hated history. I it was like, here, you get this mimeograph sheet of purple writing, uh, dates and, and events that happened, but you never really got around to figuring out what the events were. You were just supposed to memorize the date and the happening name, and that was your test. Which right. means and you didn't lose you you didn't really learn anything. No, I I think really history is the stories, and the mm-hmm. stories is what's so important, and that's what I tried to convey when I was a teacher, and that dovetails in nicely with writing historical fiction, is writing the stories of people and events and happenings and occurrences of the past. Mm. And, and I learned history is from historic novels. I never learned history from a teacher. And Nancy goes down rabbit holes. She got into the rabbit hole of eugenics. Thank you, Matt. And so it was teaching me all kinds of things yesterday. Because Did I you know this? <laughs> I never heard that term in school. When I mean, I learned about World War II and I learned about Hitler, but they never used eugenics. I never heard that term. Mm. So I found that like, wow. Mm. Well, let's let's back up on that because I want people to have an overview of City Gone Askew and also just touch on Velma Gone Awry because this is really the, the I call him El Balo, which is wrong. Yeah. It's eight Balo, um, but it's really a private eye series and it's really back in the 20s, right? That, that this series is going on. You want to give everyone just a brief overview and, and we can touch on City Gone Askew so people know what's, what's out now. Nancy's read both of them and, um, We can touch on some of the themes in the books, but just give everyone an overview first, Matt, so that we don't go off down rabbit holes too early because we want to. (laughs) Yeah, well, this series is uh, set in the 1920s in Brooklyn, New York, 
So it's the Roaring Twenties, the age of prohibition and speakeasies, the jazz mm. era, uh, and mm. all sorts of legendary events and figures that are taking place in this time. And it came about because I write historical fiction and I write mysteries. And I said, hey, I want to write a historical PI mystery. So mm. that was the onus of the thought that created Eight Bellow, who is a Hungarian PI in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And he's, his name is Eight, like the numeral, because he was the eighth child born to Hungarian immigrants living in Brooklyn. And his mother was so sure that he was going to be a girl to even the scale at four girls and four boys that she had picked out a name, Marguerite, for him. But when he turned out to be a boy, she was a little stunned and wasn't ready for it. Dad was off to sea, so she merely wrote down the numeral eight on the birth certificate, meaning to change that later, but never got around to it. So Eight Bello is a PI in Bushwick. He's a veteran of World War One. He has a very colorful cast of friends. His best friend is a black business entrepreneur, Pearl. And he has a Brooklyn Eagle journalist friend named Marty and uh, the Irish cop. Um, so he has these fictional friends as well. And he becomes intertwined with a lot of real life characters, such as Dorothy Parker becomes a mainstay mm. of the book. Um so I guess I could just give a little background of City Gone Askew, if you want. Yeah, mm. yeah. So in City Gone Askew, Eight Bell Low is hired by the widow of a man who has been run over. And the police have said that it was an accidental death, but she believes that he was murdered and that it was on purpose. And then she further confides that there has been this priceless Aquila stolen which is a Roman eagle standard that the Roman army used to carry into battle 2,000 years ago. And um, at one point in history, and this is all true, um, some tribes in the uh, Bativia region of you know Germany area rose up against and attacked these Roman eagle uh, legions and defeated them and wiped them out and stole the Roman Eagle standard, the Aquila. And this has been passed down through the generations in a secret organization. And uh, yeah. so this has now been stolen, and that's kind of what gets the whole process rolling. And we're going to get much more complicated as we go, as I tend to do. I like that. We like that about your writing. I mean, you... <laughs> I mean, your brain is fascinating to me. I mean, I just want to know, like, how, how, I mean, do you have these ideas all the time, like, that you have to write down, like, ooh, wouldn't that be cool if this happened? Oh, it did happen in history. Let me use this somewhere. I mean, are you constantly writing things down? Like, I mean, just you know, in a, I, a, a missing Aquila, that's like, who comes up with that? <laughs> you know? I don't necessarily write these things down, but they get tucked away. Actually, mm -hmm. the, concept of where this book came from was the third book in my clay wolf series mousetrap mm. which was about genome editing and genome editing has its roots going all the way back to the eugenics movements in the early 1900s so i'd sort of tucked away this eugenics movement and when i started writing about the 1920s i said well let's look further into that and uh, I found that, you know, it was really taking place right outside of Brooklyn and Cold Spring Harbor was the main focus of it all. And uh, one thing just led to another. Wow. And Nancy, well, it kind this of kept crazy. you going. <laughs> well, no, it's kind of crazy when you think about that actually happening. You know, it's like people trying to play God. And it, it um, when, you, when you look at someone like Hitler being involved, um, it that's a freaky notion because he was kind of a freaky person. I mean, you know, right. it, it, there's nothing about, um, there was no benefit to anybody but him in what he was trying to do. 
and yet he had followers, which is interesting to me. It's like um, the certain people that you can see they have no interest in serving, like as a public servant, politician, public servant, you're supposed to serve the public. You're not supposed to control them and tell them what to do. Yes, you have a handle in making laws, but the idea is, is um, that you're a public servant helping people, but it doesn't often go that way. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, you when know. it goes wrong, it goes way wrong. History has a long line of very charismatic figures that are able mm. to harness the power of hatred. Yeah. And hmm. looking down on different groups of people. And, you know, that's sort of what the eugenics movement was. And that's what Nazism was. But, hmm. you know, it's sprinkled all through history of these things happening. And it's unfortunate, but somehow that, you know, power of hatred is able to be harnessed. Well, it, it, when you were writing that... this, go ahead, go ahead, Nancy. Sorry. I was just going to say it's interesting when I look at my personal history. And knowing that I have a grandfather that was a Nazi and more than just a member of the Nazi party, he was a, um, he Assistant. did more than just, yeah, he was, he was, he was a nut. Um, but he had, my brother and I used to sneak when we had to stay at my grandparents' house. There was a hallway and a staircase told never to go down and never go to this room. And we're like, oh, yeah, watch this. And we did. And we found a tunnel going out of the house, going down the hill to the duck pond. And and we saw stuff in that tunnel that no kids could see. And it was an interesting, it was an eye-opener of who my grandfather really was and how close the, that um, Nazi party was in Southern California, how how actually strong they were, that they were even there. And, and it's, you know, at first I used to think, oh, that's just a story. Now I know that that's not so. It's actually true. Mm. So it's, it's scary when it's that close to home. Well, how was it reading Matt's book? When you look at all these connections, you know, Nazi eugenics, which really happened and happened to women. And when you look at, like, historically, you know, you, you you know, Matt, you're writing this in the twenties and look what has happened a hundred years mm-hmm. from then to now where we are in 2024, a hundred years has gone by and we're recycling the mm-hmm. same traits, right? We're not, it's not over. Yeah. It's not over. I was so, stunned in my research with how often I would say, boy, not much has changed in a hundred years. Wow. Because this book is set in 1924 and, you know, outside of, you know, technology and iPhones and the Internet, it seems like a lot of those ideas and beliefs and um, mm-hmm. politics and entertainment and everything is pretty much the same as it was 100 years ago. Yeah. And wow. I think, you know, like when you start talking about the Ku Klux Klan, I mean, that's like gathering all the horrible people together in one spot. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, it, it, and, and to know that they are still around, because they are, is, is a scary thing. Mm. Mm. When, when you were writing this, did this kind of, I know you're saying, well, not, not much has changed, right? Did right. you want people when they're reading the novel City Gone Askew to think to think that and, and kind of realize kind of like a wakey wakey moment um in reading this? Oh absolutely as you know a historian, mm-hmm. as a history teacher, as a history major in college, you know, what you do realize is that history just goes in cycles. And you know, if we could learn more about history and understand it better, maybe we could avoid that cycle coming around and say, no, let's not do this again. Let's not relive the eugenics movement. Let's not relive, you know, Nazi Germany. But, you know, it seems like all throughout history, 
people haven't been able to figure out how to learn and avoid that cycle coming back around. Mm-hmm. It, it is a, it's an eye opener because certain people pop up in politics and they dress in a suit and a tie and and um, they here to be part of humanity, not thinking they're above humanity and not trying to be the controller of the entire world, but they're there. You know, there are people here who want to control the world in their fashion for their purposes. Mm -hmm. And it's scary to think that. And yet they're here and we know they're here. But what do we do about it? Mm. Yeah. The, yeah. You know, the, the, the evil beings mm-hmm. that can harness that hatred. When you said that, the power, harnessing the power of hatred, I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. it gave me like, mm-hmm. like the creeps. Cause it, yeah, it, it it's is creepy. Good. And they, and it, people come in all kinds of disguises and, mm-hmm. It's like, oh, everybody looks well to do on this, you know, idyllic street in a suburb America, but you never know what's going on behind closed doors, you know? And I think what's interesting about you touching on eugenics and it being near Brooklyn, I've always heard the eugenics side, it's in the backwoods of the South, right? And right now, as we record this, we're in the backwoods of Arkansas. And, and I'm going, what really happened on this, you know, historic mine property? You know, did this happen back then here where we are? You know, you always think that Arkansas has gone through so much history and terrible history, yet is working very hard to unify. And it's not quick enough in a lot of ways, but they're really trying. And to tell the story and to, to interpret it correctly, which is difficult. And I think that's where the power of books and novels Mm -hmm. that give you those pieces of truth and then allows you to go down rabbit holes like Nancy. She was Googling eugenics all day yesterday and going Mm -hmm. all the way back to Plato. Um, Anyway, so I I couldn't believe that he was part of that. Like he was, yeah, I had no idea. Like everybody, you know, listened to everybody said he was a really smart guy. And apparently he was, (laughs) but, but like, Oh no. But Brooklyn, like I thought Brooklyn was pretty like him, like an ambitious area and it's a city with, you know, new ideas and thoughts. So I was kind of astonished to hear that it was in Brooklyn, in the Brooklyn, the backwoods of Brooklyn, right? The back, the yeah. back doors, the, you yeah. know, wow. So that means yeah, it's everywhere. No, and you know, I think as these things often start out with, they start with the best of intentions of, you know, let's work on eradicating um, insanity or other um, physical or mental defects. And hmm. that becomes questionable already because they're playing mm-hmm. God. But then mm-hmm. they start taking it further and further and saying, okay, let's start, you know, uh stamping out you know these different uh ethnicities that we don't think are as good as we are trying to be that diplomatic is, here <laughs> yeah i know yeah. and it's and it's difficult because it it's a very offensive subject well it's it's i mean it's death i mean yeah, and that that and it's and taking away human rights right and we keep so, saying it over and over we keep going to wars we keep causing wars you know, and um, and I'm talking about all of humanity. I'm not talking just the United States. I'm talking that people just don't seem to be able to let other people live and believe what they want. Mm-hmm. Like, if I believe something different from somebody else, I really don't care what somebody else believes as long as they're not hurting anybody. Mm-hmm. But it, th- there's just so many people who can't, let another person have their own belief system. I understand if the per- the belief system is doing something harmful to others, but you some know, people they, they can't let a person have an opinion. That's different. And even on top of that, Nancy, you know what happens to Betty Young in the mm-hmm. novel City on a Skew? Yeah, actually happened 
to hundreds of thousands of American women over the years. It's crazy. It's mm. crazy. Um, let, let's actually touch on eugenics and what it is. Um, because I think it's still a hidden, dirty word in this country that there's, I, it's kind of hushed, hushed. Wouldn't you say, Matt, for even our younger generation may not know that this is part of our history? Yeah, no, I, you know, there, it really sprung up in the early 1900s and went right through world, the beginning of World War II because, and it was very popular in the United States. Most of the wealthy people in the United States, you know, what we would consider the one percenters today were behind it. You know, the eugenics, uh, lab in Cold Spring Harbor was the Carnegie Institute of <sighs> eugenics in Cold Spring mm-hmm. Harbor, but a lot of very wealthy people were for it. Politicians were behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, there was, you know, at, at the same time, there was movements to limit immigration of undesirables, which included Italians and Jews and Asians. Mm-hmm. Um, so 1924, the Reed Johnson Act was passed, which kind of dovetailed and went hand in hand with the eugenics movement which was to cut down on undesirable people as these wealthy people and politicians saw it. And what they were doing was they did, you know, tens of thousands of surveys of different people, but then they started with criminals and people that were insane and started sterilizing mostly Mm -hmm. the women, but sometimes the men. Mm Mm-hmm. And over time, that evolved into wanting to sterilize other undesirables, such as black people, Native American people, and uh, mm-hmm. on and on and on. Because as we state in the book, you know, they think that the only desirable people are the Western Europeans who have come to America and become Americans. It's wow! So how it it plays out? It plays is probably not a good word. Well, well, when plays. you say the undesirables, I find that interesting because we hear that term quite a bit, don't we? These mm-hmm. days, yes. we hear <laughs> that term, and now that now you freak me out again. But um, this movement is. Oh, I know we're going to be doing a cult show soon. In November, there's a oh, cult boy. awareness day, um, which we're excited about. And I'm also getting so fascinated about these utopian societies. It's become a weird rabbit hole for me. And this is more like the, oh, it's like, so the eugenics is really everybody wants the perfect race, right? The perfect people. And as, as according to them. What they according deem. to them, yes, yeah, what they what deem they perfect do. color skin, all of that, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. mind, all of that, and then you look at they want to be God, be the per- we're going to have the perfect race, the supreme race, right? Well, now, race. What, now you hear your the words that you're saying, and you can see how easily that leads into what Adolf Hitler adopted mm-hmm. from the eugenics movement. And wanted the perfect race, the Aryan race of the, mm-hmm. you know, perfect German Aryans. And that's where it wow. came from. Can wow. Can imagine if everybody was perfect walking around being perfect? How boring I mean, would that be? <laughs> <laughs> it's like everybody's been sterilized where, at that point. Where, it's like the valley of the would, dolls. Yeah. Where would the creativity come in? Uh-uh. Yeah, That's okay. yeah I, I think if they were eradicating the non-perfect people, I would be the first to go. Well, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. Like, no way. I already drink way I, I too much it wine. Is, is, <laughs> it, is, it is amazing to me that, okay, how do I bring the God thing in here? Uh-oh. Um, that, well... Okay, let me say, for example, in politics, we are still having political people where on the Bible. Yes. Whether or not they're a Christian, and we have politicians who say they're Christians but never been in a church. I'm just saying that. That's reborn. You know, so it is interesting how we cling to religion, but we don't follow any Mm. of what we're 
Well, where's our religious freedom? Okay, so in schools in Louisiana, apparently, apparently, so don't come after me, apparently, um, they are making uh, each teacher to put put up uh, the Ten Commandments in the classrooms. So is that religious freedom? You know, I'm just asking. Um, so it's it's kind of this weird control thing that we have, and I think politics has gone into the same. I don't see any different anymore. You will believe what I want, and that's that. And then two sides decide that they're going to be completely opposite and fight each other, and you must side with one of them, you know, because, Lord, how dare you have a thought in between the two? You know, can't that can't happen. You must be a party person. You must. You're forced to it. You must do it. Don't you dare have an independent thought. Don't have an independent party. You must go to the popular high school kids' homes and be at that party, right? Not just go do your own thing. It, it's, it's, we're, we're like that. I think human beings are these, we are conformists and some of us will be the sheep and some of us will be the leader. And it's easier that way if we all just do that instead of think for ourselves. And that's a danger. The beauty of books and we're recording this on national book lovers day which is cool the beauty of books is that you can read something Mm -hmm. and it's a co-creative experience always talk about that because you're visualizing you know eight balo i say el balo but i i shouldn't say that should i um eight Mm -hmm. bello um you are when you're reading about him you can see him um you're you're turning it into a movie in your mind you're questioning yeah. things. You're oh, thinking yeah. things. You're going to be like Nancy, go down a rabbit hole, start Googling Plato and eugenics, see what you get. So mm-hmm. I think that fiction, historical fiction especially, and books helps people to not be the conformist, to ask questions, to have independent thoughts. As a writer, do you think that I'm right on that at all? <laughs> because I kind of feel like, we need the arts to separate what is going on in general of what humans are doing. And like, we all need, like, it's like homeowners associations. We must live in this box. Do not dare put a pink plant in the front of your yard, you know? Yeah. And so we need the creative <laughs> we must world the to kind of overthrow this. Everybody live in a box on the hillside, ticky tacky mm-hmm. houses you know, we need to get past that. Does that make sense, Matt? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, rebel, there's, certainly, people rebel. <laughs> there's certainly a lot to unpack from everything you just said, but Sorry. I think absolutely that, uh, you know, people tend to be conformists and, you know, follow the lead of others. And, you know, if I wear a colorful shirt, people are just blown away and they're like, oh, nice shirt. What You're crazy. What's going on? And it's like, It's a Hawaiian shirt, you know, but everybody wants to look like everybody else. And being a seventh and eighth grade teacher, that's what seventh and eighth graders want. They want to conform and be exactly like each other. And somehow that's how our culture goes. I would like to think that, you know, writing gives people a look at other worlds and other places and other thoughts. And Mm -hmm. that imagination might create some uh, bucking the trends and, you know, that that would be fantastic if that really works out. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why I think historic novels are so important. I've learned more from historic novels um, once I had got a... <laughs> than I did from school. I've mm-hmm. learned way, way, way more. And mm-hmm. it, I find them fascinating. I read several different authors all the time, um, mostly historic novels, because I learned what I didn't learn elsewhere, you know, and it it becomes really very personal Mm -hmm. because you can stop and think about things. You can question things. You can go look it up if you have more questions. And I find it a freedom um, that is necessary for humanity to have that. It's necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's in a right. You need to have it. You need to be able to research and follow things and learn. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. And I want to ask you, Matt, as an author, I know you do a lot of book events and having a background, you know, obviously majoring in history and then also teaching history. When you're doing your book events, do you do any kind of speaking on things like eugenics? What was going on with the KKK and Nazis and how this whole history part happens? Do you do that? Obviously, like we're having a conversation on on the podcast here, but do you do kind of speaking engagements where you explain some of that history? Uh, Absolutely. Lately, my talks have been sort of uh, on the evolution of a book from idea to research to writing to editing to marketing to promoting. And Mm -hmm. I'll talk about each of those topics, and I focus on the most recent book. So uh, just uh, Wednesday, I was up in Greenville on Moosehead Lake doing a talk at the library there about City Gone Askew and the evolution Mm -hmm. of it. And so I absolutely, you know, in the idea and research phase of it, talk about how the eugenics movement came about Mm. and, you know, how the whole concept of the book began and some of the research pieces that I put in and visiting places there, which are Mm. kind of fascinating and fun. And so, you know, that's uh, kind Mm. of dovetails into the reading that I might do today at some point. Mm. Yes, I was going to ask you, tell us about the mafia. I mean, you got the mob in here too. Let's not leave them out. I mean, they're kind of... Obviously, they're bad, right? And we've done so many shows on the mafia and the mob, and I always have to be reminded it's not a romantic kind of thing. They sound romantic. I think the movies have romanticized the mob, right? But they cold-blooded killed people and were torturous and cruel. But they also did some good things in history, too. It's kind of like pirates and privateers. The privateers tended to do better things than the pirates, from what I've understood. But you can't say all is, you know, like we know Hitler was 100% bad, even though he had a dog. You know, figures it was a Jack Russell. But, (laughs) (laughs) but, but, you know, it's like when you look at the mob, they did some good things in some parts of history, which is so it's kind of an odd thing. So tie in a little bit of the mafia in here. Well, you know, we started off with Velma Gonorai and Eight Bello crosses paths with two very young uh, mobsters of the time who are basically not quite out of their teenage years, Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Seagal. And these two are going to go on to become two of the most powerful, famous mobsters ever. And they're already starting to make a name for themselves. And they've got a, you know, home office down in Brownsville and a place called the Candy Store, and they're out back there. Uh, Meyer Lansky is going to go on, and he's going to take, he's going to be part of my book, I Am Cuba, because he's very involved with the gambling and vice in Havana. And Bugsy Seagal is going to basically be one of the ones that starts Las Vegas. So he's, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of running that whole Mm -hmm. thing. But at this point, they're both still pretty young. And in this book, I weave in a little bit more with Charlie Lucky Luciano, who's already becoming a kind of a a big kingpin in the world of uh, mobsters. And he's going to become one of the more famous and uh, will get in prison for tax evasion later in the late 30s, but then will be released from jail so that he can unite the Teamsters of New York to uh, make sure that uh, Nazi submarines do not come into the harbor. And Mm. for that, he's let out of jail and then eventually uh, exiled back to Italy. Uh, So these are characters that overlap with 8 Ballo, and he finds occasion to need their help, and they need Mm. his help. And so in my book, these horrible people, as you deem them, are going to do some very good things for a fellow to help him out. And that's kind of humanity, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. Nobody except maybe Hitler is all good or all bad. Yeah. That's exactly what I was saying. It's That's the the weird thing about, like, the mafia. They did some good stuff. And, you know, 
you know, prohibition. I mean, people got happy because of them doing prohibition. <laughs> so, you know, they did some good things in, in there. But I know you were going to read a, a portion of City Gone Askew. Yeah, I'll, let me tell the little story leading into mm-hmm. the portion that I'm going to read because um, as part of my research, I was going online and reading the Brooklyn Eagle from 1924. I read it every day for a year. And in that, I came across a kind of a cryptic ad about a tavern called The Back Room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that it was really advertising a speakeasy, even though it was illegal to be serving alcohol at that point, and they were covering it up as a tavern. But really, it was a a speakeasy. And then I was going to visit my daughter in Brooklyn and do some research, and I came across that there was a back room in Lower Manhattan, and upon looking further, I put it together that it was the same place and that it hadn't changed anything since it was an illegal speakeasy in the 1920s. Oh, um, wow. And so I said, well, that would be a really great place to, you know, kind of check out and see what it was like. And as I looked further into it, I came across information that there was a back room to the back room. Mm-hmm. And in this cool. back room, was where Charlie Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and Bugsy Seagal would meet and came up with Murder Incorporated on an assassination for hire business and laid the foundation for what is now the modern day mafia in the back room of the back room. So wow. I did make plans to go visit that. I contacted the manager. And uh, she said, yeah, sure, come in and ask for me, and I'll take you into the back room of the back room, which is not open to the public. And so my wife and my daughter and I went there one Friday afternoon for cocktails. Typical family. Well, happy hour. <laughs> I'm, excuse me, but this is a typical happy family outing the with the cost the family. <laughs> <laughs> and And as you would have it, the manager was out sick that day. And oh. nobody knew anything about it. So, you know, but it, it was pretty interesting. You you know, it's a it's typical speakeasy where you lower Manhattan, a dark street. You go between some iron gates and down these steps and down an alleyway. And there's no signs or anything. And smoke is rising up. And you go around a corner. And there's another set of stairs up to a green door. And you open this green door. And, you know, jazz music comes flooding out. There's a live jazz band in there. There's these huge chandeliers in place. Every It's packed with people, and they're all drinking from these pewter cups because, mm-hmm. obviously, I guess, prohibition agents were not that intelligent back in the day, and if they busted in and saw everybody drinking out of teacups, they would have said, oh, sorry, our bad, and just left. Um, <laughs> but I had gone up and asked for the manager who was out sick, and nobody knew anything, so we got a, a drink and went and found a table in a corner and my daughter said, I'm going to, I'm going to get us back there. And she stood up and kind of stalked off. And about five minutes later, she came back with this huge, massive guy, maybe six, seven bald head. His head was just huge. Uh, she had him by the ear and was dragging him. Well, maybe she didn't have him by the ear. That might not be quite this true. Is funny. <laughs> and she comes over and says, this is Bob. Bob said he would show us the back room. Cool. And sure enough, Bob and you know we we followed Bob, cut through the crowd, pushed some people aside, pushed open the bookcase that led into the back room of the back room, and he went into this small room that was maybe thirty feet by twenty feet, uh, not very big, and nothing special, uncomfortable furniture, a worn rug, no windows, but you could Ooh. get the vibe of Mm. this is where they devised, you know, Murder Incorporated and laid the foundation of the modern-day mafia. So Mm. uh, I I was going to read a little piece from when Eight Ballot and his friend Pearl go to the back room to meet with Lucky Luciano to ask a favor because Jack Johnson, the boxer, has come to Eight Ballot and said that Luciano wants to kill him because he uh, made time with Luciano's mistress, or Maul, as they call them in the gangster land. And uh, 
asks Eight Bello if he'll go intercede on his behalf. And so Eight Bello and Pearl go to visit the back room of the back room. And that's what I was going to read. Cool. Cool. Um, so we'll start with eight speaking. That'd be the one eight said. What do you say to overlooking a moment of weakness by Mr. Johnson, a mistake of epic proportions, and let him keep breathing the air? I might be able to overlook his transgressions on account of his work in the ring, and more importantly, you asked me. Luciana leaned forward on his arms and gave eight a piercing and intense stare. If you think you might be able to do me a favor, that is. Eight sensed that the the trap was being laid in plain sight, but he was still going to be unable to avoid it. What's that? Meyer tells me you've got a head on your shoulders. What can I help you with, Lucky? I want to hire you to dig up some dirt on a gent, Luciano said. Don't you have plenty of people for that sort of thing? Thing is, I don't think an Italian or a Jew would have very much fun... Uh, A luck poking around in this gent suitcase, if you know what I mean. No, I don't know what you mean. Luciano (laughs) sighed, sat forward. On account of him being a racist pig who don't like Italians and Jews is why. A fellow like you, on account of your white skin and being from the north of the European continent, why you should be able to open more doors than my boys could. You'll have to narrow it down as racist pig describes about half of our fair city. Lucky stared at him, a slight grin creasing his stony visage. The one I'm speaking of is a gent called Herman Wall. You heard of him? Sounds familiar, but I can't quite place him. He's a school teacher who fancies himself a scientist and expert on immigration. He works for the Carnegie Institute of Washington out in Cold Spring Harbor. His testimony to Congress that we Italians are undesirable as citizens helped pass that Johnson-Reed Immigration Act this year. That law drastically reduced the number of my countrymen who can enter the United States. The Carnegie Institute, he thought, keeping his face impassive, the same place that Carl Vogel was on the board, a small world indeed. If I recall, it put a ban on all Asians as well. Lucky waved his hand dismissively. Yeah, yeah, and a whole bunch more. Seems the only pure white people are those from Western Europe. The rest of us are all pezzy de murdy to be wiped off on the shoe before entering the United States. But your concern is the Italians and the Jews. It was Arnie's idea to come speak with you. He's got it in his mind that he can get that racist act rescinded. The brain, he's got connections in the government, and he started the wheels turning. I'm sorry, Aid said, but I still don't understand my part in all of this. Pearl cleared his throat. He wants you to dig up some dirt on this wall, fellow. Take away his credibility. Luciano snapped, slapped the desk. Bingo, my man, Pearl. You hit that one right on the head. Now I see why the big man brought you along. Credibility. Love that. Eight nodded slowly as he processed this information. And you think that discrediting the expert testimony of Herman Wall will help that cause? That's about it. You know, they based their quotas on us on the 1890 population census. On account of so many Italians and Jews came here in the years between then and now. If they used a more recent census, there wouldn't be so near, wouldn't be nearly so many restrictions on our immigration status. Using that number has got to be illegal or something. What if I can't find any dirt on the man? Then you ain't looking hard enough. The man is as dirty as they come. You poke around, you'll find some stuff, trust me. What is it that Herman Wall is an expert in, Aid asked. Some sort of notion that certain races of people are superior to others just due to their genes, Luciano said. What was it that you called it, Meyer? Lansky crossed one leg over another and cleared his throat. Eugenics, he said. And that's what I'm going to read today. Wow, you can keep going. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just, that's cool. Do you read your own audiobooks? No, I, I do not. And I don't think I would be nearly as good as the people that do my audiobooks. So I'm glad to have them. I'm glad you do them because mm. so many people read that way. 
you know, and um, I, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. What a good way of explaining it because you never think and, of it from that side, right? And wow. it's a really good book and you learn your history this way. It's cool. Mm. It's personal and you remember it. Mm-hmm. What's I'm next, down, Matt? I think that could be in all schools. It should be in schools. I think kids should be reading historical history fiction history all the time. Should, yeah, I think it should be in mm-hmm. schools. And more young adult novels. You know, um, I know that, yeah, you know, why is, is big, but not as much. I mean, they're doing a lot of climate change kind of themed YA novels and middle grade novels. I don't know what the difference is, but, um, on ages, <laughs> Matt, you do, but do you ever consider doing a historical fiction novel for our youth? You know, my original Joshua Chamberlain, which is called at every hazard. I started, I did the research and writing of that when I was still teaching middle school. And the intent of that book was really aimed at high school age students, thinking that it would be a good book to be in the high school to teach about the Civil War and Joshua Chamberlain. Um, and so that one really could could be done for that age group. But then I tended to get a little grittier, and uh, I'm not sure that all the parents would be happy with my books being in the school system. So. <laughs> Well, you know, there you go. <laughs> there you go. It happens. It happens. You know, meantime, kids are saying things worse than we thought. So I don't know, but no kidding. I know. I know. It's like they can teach us some words these days, but, um, I, you know, I think Nancy's really right about the power of historical fiction. Mm. And I think, you know, this obviously is, is teaching us something that we should be knowing about now if we don't know about it. Um, and and to remember and remind us what can happen when things go askew, right? I love that word. <laughs> um, so this is there, these are two of the same series. Are you writing more? What what's next? And I mean, it's like I know you go around speaking about all your different books, but the, how hard is that for you? Like if you're in the throes of writing something else, to go backwards and say, okay, I will go back to this book, but I'm really into this right now, you know. You know, that's part of my talk on the evolution of a book is the fact that, you know, I write every day in the morning for three or four hours, but then the rest of the day is spent uh, often editing another book or two or three, depending. I've had to edit three different books at the same time at different points because I do my edits. I have a paid for editor and then my publisher has two different editors that go through it. So depending on where we are in the edits of different books, I might be editing up to three different books. Wow. Uh, right now I've been marketing and pushing out mainly Mayhem, which is my next book, and that comes out November 13th. And so I've been reaching out to venues to do talks, reaching out to podcasters and radio people and whatnot to you know get going on that book. And, uh, so, and, you know, as you said, I'm currently promoting City Gone Askew. So I think I have 12 or 13 different speaking engagements this month where I'll be going out and talking about this book. So right now I'm writing, (laughs) uh, books are usually a year and a half out from when you finish writing them and send them off to the publisher. So I have mainly Mayhem in November, and then I have the beginning of a new series in April, uh, which is The Not-So-Merry Adventures of Max Creed, which is a modern-day Robin Hood. And I've um, also written a book set in 1955 Raleigh, North Carolina, which I don't have a date for release on yet, and I just finished up my editing for it, and we'll be sending it out. And then uh, um, I'm currently writing the second in my Max Creed modern day Robin Hood sort of stories. So, you know, I'm writing one, editing a few different ones, marketing a different one and promoting a different one. And that keeps it all fresh. 
I was mm-hmm. going to say, I mean, I think it's time for a happy wow. hour. You just like tired me out there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, let's do it. <laughs> let's, you know, do you want any, like, I would think, and Nancy, you tell me how, you, you know, cause you finished it. She steals your books, literally. And I was so excited to actually have the physical <laughs> copy thinking I can, st-. she literally, I'm not kidding, Matt. She knows how to steal and she knows where I hide things. You can't, out, right. you know, outwit your mother. And she well, does she it. share after she reads it? Um, yeah. I only got it last night. And you know what she did? She put it where the wine is. <laughs> so that was like a right peace now. offering of like, okay, it's- I know you're going to go have another glass of wine. So here. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so she was kind in the end. But um, Nancy, would you think that this would be a cool series like this book series as like a Netflix series or something like that? Oh. I I could turn this into to a television, so this would be. Oh well, like, I didn't know you had those qualities. You go, girl. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Let's, look, look. Look. Yeah, this could yeah. be. Get this going, could, Nancy. Yeah, this could be on television for sure. Yeah. Okay, let's talk. You you can yeah. be the producer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, only if she gets to blow things no, and, up and delete know, things. And I was, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, when you when you look at um, detectives on television is there one that you would choose to be a follow like you know i was was trying to think oh let's see who has there been and i i went all the way back to jim gardner and i can't remember even the name of the character he played is that the rock rockford files yeah yeah that's it thank you yeah, I, I yeah, that wouldn't be a bad person because yeah, I've struggled yeah. to envision an eight fellow myself because he's, you know, this Different. really large man kind of mm. bursting out of everything. Uh, mm-hmm. and at the same time, you know, sort of a calm presence with, you know, a very sophisticated thinking mechanism. So yeah, uh, it, I, I've had a hard time coming up with any particular actor that might be him, but mm. if, if presented with that problem, I would probably think about it harder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I think it'd be cool. I, yeah. I think this is just to me to go backwards and what a cool era. I would like to make a set list, uh, not a set list. Sorry. I went back in my music days here. I lost my mm-hmm. voice and it reminded me of when I was a singer and like how to get through podcasts with a bad voice other than singing. I could actually pull it off a lot better but um i would love to do a playlist a music playlist for this series because yeah I yeah mean, there's so much great jazz music oh, that, you know so we yeah. finally get yeah. louis armstrong back in yeah. new york from chicago in 24 so we get to throw him into the book a little bit yeah but you know coleman hopkins is around there a lot and may oh. west and just you know a lot of smack henderson and you know just a lot of Mm -hmm. great musicians so it's a lot of fun and there was a lot of smack running around too there was and (laughs) and you got to think about louis armstrong in those days you know he was addicted to pot right he was a total stoner and i just think about how the power of his lungs like he must have been able to be like he he could have done like massive bong loads like because of his lungs you know (laughs) i was always thinking about this but he was addicted to licorice because he had because he had the munchies all the time. And so it was like a digestive aid for him. Like, sorry, this mm. is going off askew. See, I'm going to be saying yeah. askew all day. But this it's is true. Lisa gone askew. It is. Yeah, it is. We <laughs> well, he did. And he was so, you know, he'd mm. sit there and play because you could always see his eyes were always bugged out. Right. And yeah, and they were. You, I mean. He had to have like the most amazing diaphragm, like, um, singing wise, by the way, <laughs> making <Yeah>. sure I <laughs> said, don't go too askew here. <laughs> just the power of his, just his chambers, his air chambers of his body mm-hmm. to me is so fascinating. And I would, I wish I could meet him, you know, and I would like to see if he could do Tuvan throat singing because I have a funny feeling he could do it because of the <laughs> way his, the pa- well, no, I know it sounds weird, but horn players yeah. are incredible what they do. It's it blows my mind every time. Sax player, trumpet, I don't care what it is. Um, mm-hmm. It blows. I, I like my how mind. you said it blows your mind. 
It does. Yeah. See, <laughs> I am with you. Are we on happy hour yet? My God. Wait, Matt, we'll be back on August 30th. We record our next happy hour. So stay tuned for that. Um, we can't wait. He is the king of Big Blend Radio's happy hour. And uh, the last one, which he missed because, you know, he's busy with all this book stuff he does. Um, we actually got our pink sock monkey Priscilla out and she took everyone on a joy ride on the bus. You missed out, Matt. I'm just saying <laughs> that we'll bring her back out next time. Okay. But thanks oh, so much. Fun. Always fun to have you on the show and you're an awesome writer and we're just, we're excited. Get writing, get more out. Come yeah. On. Yeah. Thank so you for having me. Books. Hey, that thank you. Everyone, fun. mattcost.net is the website to go to from there. You can link to wherever you want to purchase the books, Amazon, all those places. Um, also try to support your independent bookstores and you can always ask for Matt's books in those independent bookstores. There's also places like bookshop.org. Am I allowed to promote them, Matt? It's cool to do, right? Absolutely. Uh, bookshop.org is great. Yeah, they're there fantastic. Go. They're um, the alternative to Amazon, not knocking Amazon, I'm just saying, and they support independent bookstores. So if you've got an independent bookstore in your town and Matt's book isn't there, all you have to do is ask and that will magically happen. Thanks so much, Matt. You take care. Yes, thanks, Matt. Thank you. You both take care as well. Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio. Keep up with our shows at bigblendradio.com.